Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Tunnel Vision, a show brought to you by uscfootball.com. I'm your host, Keely Orr. Thanks for waiting. We had a little bit of technical difficulties, but we're here. Uh, I'm joined by Ryan Abraham and Shotgun Spratling. We're back. We were had a little bit of a hiatus for fall camp. It was a little bit, a little bit of madness, but we were back. We survived fall camp. So did USC. And of course, we're going to be talking about it, and we're going to be recapping the USC fall showcase that happened just a day ago. We're going to talk about the quarterback battle. Will USC name a quarterback soon? We will discuss. We'll also talk about the Coliseum renovation. Were you there? Were you able to see anything at the Fall Showcase? Let us know in the comments. And of course, we'll be taking live calls today. 5124-TUNNEL. You can call us, rant to us, do whatever you want. You can call us at that line. You can also tweet at us. Hashtag TunnelVision. I will see your tweet and put it on the show. And like always, the normal platform that you're watching it on, whether it's YouTube, which we got working, Facebook Live, or Periscope. Put your comments, questions, concerns, and we will answer them. Guys, that was a mouthful, but yeah. we're here. Fall camp has progressed. It happened. Uh, what? I just want to get your overall thoughts. I know that's hard to do because so much happened in the last two weeks, but what were your takeaways and overall impressions from USC's fall camp? Yeah, today kind of felt like post-game day, you know, because really you were did. at the scrimmage yesterday, the Coliseum, the new renovation. They said about 10,000 people were there. Eh, eh, maybe it was, that's, well, that was my guess going in. I don't know if that many people were actually there, but... You kind of felt like this was this game day atmosphere. We had all this analysis going up on uscfootball.com. Make sure you subscribe. There's tons of premium content up there right now if you want to break it all down. We had everybody there in the press box writing away, taking notes and all this kind of stuff. But, yeah, you felt like that, Keely. Like this was sort of like a post-game uh, situation. It's a little bit different feel for me, this fall camp shotgun. You know, a few years ago, you'd have two-a-day practices, practicing every day. There was more days off now. They're not doing the two-a-day stuff. Uh, really, we don't get to watch any more practice. We had basically two weeks of what we got to see. And now it's going to be you can watch stretching, and that's about it. So I would have liked to see more like camp, you know, more of just like competition hitting and things like that. But they're really trying to, you know, get back into game mode kind of right away. And that's what this week will be. It'll be a mock game week, then the regular game week. Uh, and But the two weeks of fall camp that were actually there just didn't seem very campy, I guess you could say. Do you know what I mean? It felt a lot like it was already game week. So when you when you say that it kind of feels like this is a post-game, you know, yesterday was a very cool event, I think, for the fans. Getting to come out. One, you get to check out the, the renovations to an extent. Unfortunately, the scholarship tower was not ready because of inspection. So there were not tours there. I was looking forward to taking a tour because I didn't go the day of the media stuff. So. Yeah. That get uh, fans got to miss out on that, but autograph sessions, some different things like that. You get to check out where your seats are, but you also got to see two weeks before the season starts. You get to see a team go and tackle each other. Yeah, you never get to do that. There's never been you know this kind of spring is basically a spring game two weeks before the season yeah, starts. That's true. Spring game with tackling and with everyone healthy and, and a, a, a participating because normally the spring game you get. I always bring up Victor Blackwell because he had three touchdowns in the spring game. You never heard from him again. <laughs> yeah. you know? uh, so there's a lot of things went off with him off the field. But also, like those type of guys would just show up, and you'd be like, oh, wow, maybe this guy would be somebody to watch out for. And then the guys that were nicked up and didn't play in the spring game would come back in the fall, and some of those guys would be forgotten about. Well, this isn't the case this year with this, this fall showcase. You're getting to see the guys that are going to be there in two weeks that are playing and starting. Now, there's still some competitions and stuff like that going on, but you know it wasn't like you're seeing a third-string guy starting with the first team because of some injuries and stuff, You know, and, and that guy's going to be back in the fall like you might in the spring. This was guys going after it and trying to earn spots. So it was fun to watch and a little bit different. So it was, it was a unique atmosphere, I think. Uh, so it's kind of cool to do that. There was some snafus. You know, it's the first time with the new Coliseum and stuff. Yeah. And, you know, not being able to get the scholarship towers and those tours. But overall, I thought it was a, a pretty cool event. And now we'll see where USC goes from here. Well, we'll see where yeah. USC goes from here as much as we can in 20 minutes that we'll see on Tuesday <laughs> and Wednesdays each week because USC is now closed practice. Yeah. So that's going to be different. But, you know, so it's going to be different for us during the season. It felt different during the fall camp. Like like you said, it didn't really feel fall campy. Yeah. Now, they can't do two-a-days. The NCAA has regulated that where you're not allowed to do those anymore. But it, you just didn't. it didn't seem like it was – separate from the season. Like yeah. Normally a fall camp, like you see a lot of young guys getting a lot of reps. There's just a lot of competition. you know. And, but this felt like there's a big competition at quarterback and there's competition for the, in the secondary. But it wasn't like 
every day is a competition period. It didn't feel that way. It felt like this was a regular practice. We're in midseason form type thing, and we're just going to go through our regular practice routine. And that's kind of what they did. You know, they didn't. They walked through it on on Thursdays. They did, you know, just shells and kind of a, a lighter practice on Thursdays. They went full pads on Tuesday. Shells on. It was basically the same thing that they're going to do during the season. So the question then becomes: Akili brought this up earlier. Uh, you know, on our podcast that will be out tomorrow was: Does it become too routine? Do you get just in kind of okay? Well, this is the same. And with eighteen to twenty-two year old kids, you kind of sometimes you need to change things up. Well, now you're going to have the same routine for the next three and a half, four months. Yeah. When does it, you know, and you lose a couple games early, does do kids get deflated and go, you know, why are we doing the same thing over and over again? Now, maybe they change it if they do lose a couple games, but it's basically <clears throat> the same thing over and over for the next four months. Yeah. One, one quick, quick thing, Keely. One thing yeah. I noticed that was different. I want to get your thoughts on this, both you guys. Um, if you watched any of USC's spring games before, they weren't necessarily always spring games. Like you said, you could have walk on shining and all this stuff, especially last spring. Like they, you know, they didn't have enough wide receivers they didn't have enough defensive backs. <clears throat> we watched a about 80 play scrimmage, 13 different drives. All of a, all but one had either the first or second team going. So it was basically the ones versus the ones and the twos versus the twos. I think the second, the last, uh, series they had like reserves in there. So I think JT Daniels got the throw to some walk-ons and things like that. But for the most part, 12 of those 13 series were like scholarship guys all over the place. It wasn't any kind of walk-on thing. It was like real. It felt like more like real football to me. Like it wasn't, this was what you're going to see. Like we mm -hmm. saw six guys on the offensive line rotate a whole bunch of different positions. And, and their second team offensive line was pretty consistent as well. But a lot of consistency as far as what they were going. You got a pretty good idea for what the depth chart was going to be, but seeing all of those drives and not having a whole bunch of walk-ons on there, I thought was a, a, an encouraging sign. So we haven't seen in like a organized scrimmage like that before. And I would even have liked to see, throw those third team guys, those walk-ins, get them, you know, a series or two in there just to give guys a break and go 30 more minutes. You know, yeah. they went for they, you know, yeah. 87 minutes is what I had, had timed out. You know, I wouldn't, you know, they scheduled it for two hours. Put a couple of drives for the walk-ons in there. Hey, they get three drives on the whole day, and so that takes up 15 minutes at most. So you get 15 more minutes with the first and second team guys where, you know, they would have had rest, so you're not overexerting them, but you still get to see those guys a little bit more. Uh, as much scrimmage and live action stuff like they had yesterday that you can do is for the better. Yeah. So I would like to see them. If you schedule it for two hours, I want to see two hours. I wouldn't mind three hours. You know, that's how long a normal football game is. Yeah. Yep. So if, if you want to, and then you want to go light after that, that's perfectly fine for me. But I would have gone as much as possible because this is this is the culmination. You know, this is the peak of fall camp. Now it goes straight into game preparation. Now everything's going to get relaxed. You know, the, the position pass will still go on, but I just don't think it's going to be as intense as it was as it should be the you know the first two weeks of fall camp. Now you're kind of all right. Maybe there's one or two guys battling for a certain position, but you're not going to have four quarterbacks battling for the same spot. I think that gets cut down at least going into this week. Yeah. Uh, now maybe it's just a three, maybe it's just a two. I think you might still have the battle. I don't know if they'll name the starter. But I, I think you will trim things down. And, and with some other positions, the same thing. I think you'll trim down the competition a little bit. So you're not going to have the big, you know, kind of the wide berth uh, of competitions. So I think you should have taken as many reps as you could have yesterday. Yeah. Which circles back to our original point about how fall camp just didn't really feel like fall camp to me. In the sense that when I think of fall camp, I think it's it's tough. You're tired. You're exhausted. It's just a mental a struggle for you to get through those weeks because you're just going as hard as you can. And and the point that I made on the podcast is that this is a team in 2018 when we saw them f when they had adversity. It was a it was a mental hurdle that they couldn't jump. They would the the Texas game when that that uh, kick was blocked. It just went downhill. And I think. If you get into a routine, this team gets comfortable, and they get comfortable quick. And I think fall camp is a perfect opportunity to have this team be on their toes and, you know, maybe blow the horns three times and think that have the team think that they're done, and then, hey, we're doing another team period. Let's go. Which they had talked about doing. I don't think we ever saw in practice them do that. But I just think that it was too much of, hey, we know everything that's coming. We know when we're going to go full pads. We know when we have to go hard. We know when we can kind of take off a little bit. And so I, I wanted to see them mix that up a little bit more just because if you're going 16-plus weeks in a season, 
why not delay the routine where you can get comfortable as put that off as far as possible so that was my whole thought on on the yeah. fall camp vibes if you will no i think that's a really good point and that that's just not clay helton's style there's usually i mean they, he comes up with a plan months before and like no matter what happens between when you come up with that plan and when camp starts or whatever you're going to be sticking to that plan and and sometimes you have to just realize like this isn't working or this isn't you know these guys aren't Go on, we're going to have to change this. We're going to have to change that. You just don't see a lot of change. And I know you can talk, like, you talk to Harvey Hyde, who, we, you know, we do podcasts and stuff with. Old school coach. I mean, he coached in the 80s at UNLV. But some of his stories are hilarious where you're just, like, looking around and you have just have to realize, hey, this isn't working. He's done things like kicked his entire assistant coaching staff off the field. Like, you did something like that, you're getting every one of those 118 to 22-year-olds' attention. Like, you sometimes you just have to do something to get – everyone's attention. And I think he's done some things like, you know, Michael Pittman talked about this where he would get called out and yelled at and things like that. Things that Clay Helton wouldn't normally do. But I think in general, I, I agree with you, Keel. Like one day you're like, oh, this is a day normally there would be uh, no pads and full pads in there. You open up your locker, you're like, oh crap, this is serious today. You know, so yeah. sometimes doing that I think would be beneficial, but you know, that's, that's not really Clay Helton style from what we've seen. And also you have to be true to yourself. You know, it, it, we say you can say a lot of these things, but if that's not your style, if you're not a in your face type, or if you're if you're very hands on and you get very far away, like players notice that stuff. You know, yeah. I, I've had a coach that was you know was not the in your face type guy, and he tried to get in your face, and you're just like it doesn't feel authentic. <laughs> you don't take it True. as seriously as yeah. maybe you even should. Yeah. And they're trying to do something different, but if it's just false, you know they're 18 and 20 year old kids, but they still can recognize that. Yeah. And, you know, and then then it becomes a bigger issue and, and other things can be involved. So I think that you got to be true to yourself, but you would like to see some variety and change some things. You know, you don't have to have set in stone ways to go about it. And you have to kind of play to your team. You know, you always say you mold your offense, you mold your defense to be what suits your, your to your strengths of your team, your players, but you, you have to do those type things. You have to be a little bit malleable and be able to change and, and mold with the group that you have. And, you know, if they're all serious, then sometimes you got to loosen them up. If they're yeah. all really loose, then you got to be strict on them. Yeah. So a coach has to recognize those things. And that's some of the things that that's been a big question mark with the with this coaching staff is hey can they do things that are out of their comfort zone a little bit it but is better for the team yeah. as far as play and what we saw in the fall showcase I thought the offensive line didn't have a good day in the sense that I think we saw a better performance from them from the Saturday before that scrimmage uh, I know in that scrimmage Marquis step kind of broke off for a, a touchdown and we saw more run production out of uh, the offense on two Saturdays ago what did you see from the fall showcase as far as the offensive line goes and as far as quarterback play? Yeah, I kind of watched and uh, charted the offensive line. We put up a lot of data up on uscfootball.com if you want to check it out, just to kind of see. And it was basically you had six guys going. Uh, so Austin Jackson mostly worked at left tackle. Um, you had Elijah Vera Tucker mostly working at left guard. Brett Nealon uh, was the full-time center for the first team except for one series. And then you had some movement uh, with you know Andrew Voorhees playing uh, right guard. And then uh, Jalen McKenzie playing right tackle. Drew Richmond was the number six guy coming in here who played. He played left tackle and he played right tackle. We saw Jalen McKenzie move to uh, inside the guard. We saw Andrew Voorhees move around. So they, th those six guys kind of moved around a lot. But I thought they did a pretty good job when they were in there. Um, the second team offensive line, maybe we not as good. I thought the, the defensive front was, was good. But so it was a tough test for the offensive line. But for this offense, all you need to do is kind of keep the quarterback uh, clean for like two and a half seconds or so. They do a pretty good job of getting the ball out quickly. And I thought the passing game worked really well. The wide receivers are ridiculously good. Um, the new scheme with them, wide, with the wide receivers, they made some really tough catches. But a lot of times you got schemed open. You know, the the one, you know, I think it was, um, was it Matt, or Matt Fink that threw to... Uh, Amon Ross St. Brown, it was like 54 yards down the wide open down the middle. Things like that we didn't see last year. It was mostly Michael Pittman making like ridiculous catches. We saw some of those, but I think the offensive line did a really nice job uh, what they were asked to do in pass protection. And it's just not as taxing, I think, from what we've seen before. The problem is with the run, you know, the unofficial stats, I mean, they were averaging about 
uh, a yard per carry. What was it like 15 carries for 17 yards or something like that? That's what 11 carries for 17 yards, maybe. It was. It was some. It wasn't very good. Whatever no. it was, and uh, so they weren't able to, to. What I saw, they weren't really able to push the pile all that well. There was some really good pressure being generated. Uh, Abdul Malik McLean, I thought, got in there. Drake Jackson batted the ball down. Christian Rector, like the the ends, I thought did a really nice job and put some extra pressure on the tackles. But it just really didn't seem like. I, I, the thing that you were worried about going into is that can this team line up and just kind of push people around a little bit outside of like marquee step from two yards out. They can do that. But I didn't see like in the middle of the field, them would be able to like run the ball and help sustain a drive. If a, if a drive was going to be sustained, it was because of the passing game, not, not because of the run game. Yeah. Well, they went fourth and two on the last two minute drill. JT Daniels threw the ball. Yeah. <laughs> so that's still, I don't think they trust the run game. The, I, you, the run game, you know, I have a lot more questions about the offense after seeing this. I thought that there would be some open holes. And there were two runs that I remember off the top of my head where there were some open holes, holes and they, you know, they got five, six yards on it. That two out of 11 or 15 or somewhere in there, some 10 to 15 runs, that's not enough. Yeah. And there were, there were at least two plays where the running back was touched three or four yards deep, and that was just because he was running into his back of his offensive lineman because they had been pushed back that far. The offensive lineman have to do better. It was it an was unacceptable job in the run game. The offensive line was atrocious yesterday in the run game, in my opinion. The, there's a huge discrepancy between the first-team offense and the second-team offense, yeah. and the first-team offensive line was still bad yesterday. Yeah. Uh, or first team offensive line, first team, second team offensive line, I should say. Uh, but yeah, I thought the offensive line was just not very good yesterday. They yeah. have to do better. You know, if they want to be successful, they have to be able to run the ball at times. You know, this offense last year, Graham Harrell ran the ball was it fifty-two percent of the time, or like forty-eight percent, so like almost half. Yeah. yeah, and that was not the case yesterday. You know, eleven to fifteen runs, where whatever we are in there. There were 70, 80 passes, yeah. I would guess 60, <laughs> 60 passes. Yeah, so it was more like four to one. Um, and now, it was Mike Leach esque. Like, but we we've been saying this isn't a Mike Leach air raid where they throw the ball 70, 75 percent of the time. It was yesterday, and and maybe that because they had to run all four quarterbacks. Quarterback competition. They wanted to throw the ball a lot, so maybe that was part of it. But it certainly wasn't. Uh, you, you, you say that, expect. but how many times have we seen them run the ball a lot? We haven't yeah. seen any scrimmages or any like real team periods, unless it's like third and short yeah. periods where it's like, okay, we're going to run the ball consistently. That just hasn't been the case. So I don't know if they, they've looked at this offense line, determined that they're not going to be able to do it, so we're going to throw the ball more than maybe Graham Harrell wants to. Maybe that's the case. But whatever it is, the offense line is not doing a good enough job right now uh, as a run-blocking group. Yeah. Now, moving guys around a lot, does that play into it? You know, you still haven't got Austin Jackson to where he's a 100% participant. Yesterday was – I mean, there was a couple a couple days during the middle of the week where he participated in almost every period. I think it was like one or two periods he did not participate in. I think he was a full participant yesterday as far as the scrimmage portion. Yeah. So I think the only time he wasn't in there is if they were moving people around. I don't think he was ever like a scratch or anything. I think yeah, like so I think yesterday might have been his someplace. first full participant day. So you get him to let these next two weeks, and he's in there all the time. And, you know, he's going to be your – cornerstone at left tackle no one's taking his spot drew richmond's not coming in and you know possibly move there's no competition there he's, he's the guy and he needs to be a dude this year he has the talent if he plays up to his potential he, he could potentially leave early and be an nfl guy i think he's that good he has the potential to be that good at least he's got some work to do obviously but you got to figure out what you're going to do at right tackle with Jalen McKenzie, Drew Richmond. Is Jalen McKenzie a tackle? Is he a guard? Is Andrew Voorhees a tackle? Is he a guard? You know, those guys are switched back and forth a little bit. You know, they, they played some second team uh, tackle as well with Andrew Voorhees. Drew Richmond, you got to figure out, is he good enough to play? He started in the SEC. He was a starter for Tennessee. But he hasn't. He hasn't blown me away. I expected no. him to come in. Yeah. And, and you expect this out of a grad transfer. When they come in, they should be able to take a spot. It doesn't matter who, who they're coming in for. If you're a grad transfer, you need to come in and take somebody's spot. And he hasn't done that yet. Yeah. So yeah, and maybe he's just getting ca caught up with the offense or whatever excuse you want to give him. But it hasn't been enough to say that guy's, that guy's got to be one of the five. Right. Now, he, maybe he ends up at tackle and Jalen McKenzie moves to the guard and you move where he's out or, you know, maybe vice versa somewhere there. You know, those are a lot of question marks still to go with that offensive line. But the, the biggest thing is they have to be better. Yeah. Now, I know Dan came away from yesterday's showcase a little bit, definitely more positive than you guys are. And he kind of framed it as going against yourself as a zero sum game in the sense that maybe this was just the defensive line playing really well. And that's why you saw breakdowns on the offensive line. But given what we saw last year, do you really think, where do you lie on? If it's a good day for the, the defensive line, it's a bad day for the offensive line. Where do you lie when you're playing yourself as far as judging each position group? 
Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, it's true. It, it's going to be a zero sum game, but you can watch and and there's going to be uh, kind of a roller coaster. There will be ebb and flows, up and downs. And there wasn't any ups for as, the, as far as the run game goes. And yeah. And what you talked about, they didn't run the ball that much. I think it was 15 attempts or something. And, and like Shotgun said, probably 60 passes. So you, you need to be able to get in a rhythm. And not having uh, Vavai Malapai out there, he was injured. Uh, but, you know, Stephen Carr basically was starting. We got to see a bunch of marquee step. And you know what he can do at 235 pounds. Um, you know, Keenan Kristen, I think, that, you know, if he can get into some space, he can do all right. But just they, they weren't going to do it consistently enough that they – you're going to push the pile and get stuff going. They just really didn't commit to the run. So I'm not going to say it's all on the offensive line, but just you got to get it going at some point. So you either could have like stuck with it and really tried to make it work, or you're going to just let them, let them pass the ball. And that's what they were doing. They let them pass the ball. So I thought the defensive line played really well. Um, I, I always said the front seven was going to have some really good depth this year. This year. You, got, you got some uh, injuries in the, it's as far as the inside linebackers go, but the, I like the what they were doing. Yeah, Brandon Peely, uh, Marlon Tui Pelotu, and Jay Tufele kind of rotating it in those tackle spots. Uh, Caleb Tremblay, which I thought would be a tackle, he was getting some some run on the outside. But having Drake Jackson and Christian Rector uh, and Abdul Malik McLean, and they were you know mixing and matching on the outside as well. And I thought they did a really nice job. I mean, it was a good looking front, and it looked different than what we saw last year. It was more like a three or four man front all the time. Yeah, there, there's some uh, there's a lot of bodies on that defensive line that are capable of playing. But you're going to run into teams that have really good defensive lines, yeah. like a Utah. Yeah. Utah has a good yeah. defensive line every year. Notre Dame has had a really good defensive line in the last four or five years. Mm-hmm. What are you going to do when you're, you're going to go, well, we ran it 11 times. We threw it 66 I just, or 15 times. Excuse me. You were right, 15 and 66 passes. Now, you may do that based on a game plan. That, that happens. You, you, know, you say, hey, well, you know, we feel much more confident throwing these short passes like they did against Notre Dame last year. But are you going to say, well, it's fourth and two and we have to throw it every time? You have to be able to find a way to run the ball, and they're not doing that right now. Yeah. You can't say, well, the defensive line was really good, and they have a lot of guys they can rotate in. Okay, so be really <laughs> good on the offensive line and be able, have some guys to rotate in there too. They yeah. don't have the depth there. That's one of the issues. So if they get, they get, an, they get two injuries on the offensive line, they're going to be in trouble. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, if, if one of them not center, if not center, so they got just uh, they have Justin Dietrich on the second line. He can step in and play center for them on that first line. I think he he's a suitable step in. Yeah, but you have Drew Richmond, and just kind of rotating in, and you, you take the five guys from the spring, and maybe Liam Jimmins, who's really raw because he hasn't played much. But th- those are your you have eight guys maybe, and th- those are those are question marks on seven and eight. If you get a couple of injuries, you're going to be in trouble there. Someone's got to step up, and that yeah. hasn't been the case. Not on the front. The first line hasn't didn't step up in that scrimmage. The second line is just – it's way – there's a big difference there's a big there. Gap, no yeah. one's really stepped up. Liam Jim is his closest to stepping up in that group. Yeah, so that will definitely be a concern going forward. Now, uh, as far as quarterback play goes, I know in spring, the last time we talked to Graham Harrell before the offseason, he said, as far as timing goes of naming a starter, he said, you'll be able to tell in fall camp who's the starter just based on the separation, based on how they play. Now, granted, I don't think we've necessarily seen that, that clear separation. So what are your thoughts about this quarterback competition and, and where it goes next? Yeah, they haven't. It hasn't been clear so far. I think now this week you're going to have to see, like you, you, know, you guys talked about, pairing it down a little bit. I mean, having all four guys. So basically, there's 13 uh, series. JT Daniels got four of them, and everyone else got three. But everyone got to work with the first team. Uh, I think Matt Fink maybe didn't get to work. Uh, I think he had two first team reps and like one with the third team. And I think Jack Sears had like uh, one with the first and two with the second. I, I, it was broken down, but it was pretty close to what everyone got to do. I don't think you can keep doing that. You need to get this offense going. You need to get the chemistry with this really good set of wide receivers with whoever's going to be the starting quarterback. Um, just looking at it, if it, you know, we thought from the beginning it was going to be JT Daniels. I haven't seen anything that's changing my mind. That, oh, it's not going to be uh, JT Daniels now. Um, I thought he did a pretty good job yesterday. He converted, like you said, that fourth down one on a two-minute drill. Um, you know, found some open receivers. There was definitely times where you saw guys, you know, little slant or something like to uh, Devin Williams, who had a great scrimmage. And you're like, that's a that's a running to grass play. That was just a he broke off his route. You saw and then JT Daniels found him in an open space. And that's how this is supposed to work. We, we didn't see it all the time, but we saw it enough. You're like, you could kind of see that was a scheme that was getting guys open as opposed to whatever they were running last year. But for me, 
I mean, I think JT Daniels had a really good uh, afternoon. I, Keenan Slovis has been – he's been fine, you know, but I don't – I think he should be probably out of the competition uh, right now. And uh, Matt Fink looked like he threw the ball pretty well and stuff yesterday. Uh, and, you know, Jack Sears had a couple of nice scrambles and everything. But I would still say it's JT Daniels for me. But like you said, Keely, I don't think anyone's like – you know, just kind of separated themselves. But I, I feel probably the most confident that JT will run what Graham Harrell wants. The one thing that I think JT did differently than the other quarterbacks yesterday, I mean, all all four quarterbacks had some success throwing the deep ball and taking advantage of one-on-one opportunities, which Clay Helton said, you know, he's really he liked their poise. He liked that they identified the one-on-one matchups and were able to throw that. The one thing JT did a little bit more than the other guys was he was able to work the ball down the field, you know, with short passes. Yeah. He was able to consistently move the ball a little bit better. You know, even the two-minute drill where, you know, they got fourth down, they let, you know, let him go for the last one. And it, Somehow the, the drive just ended on second down, it seemed like, or third down. It was oh. kind of weird at yeah, the end. Yeah, it was like in the middle of there the was drive. Like a, there was like a walk-on drop, and then it kind of ended for some yeah, reason. It was, yeah, it was, was kind of weird. weird. But, you know, the, his drives, you know, he was able to complete the six, seven-yard passes. And even a couple – there was one drive in particular. I think he was with the second team offensive line. And there were a couple plays that were negative plays. There was a, a run that – I think he was sacked one time from the back, and maybe there was a run that got stopped short. But both times he was able to overcome those with 10, 12-yard passes instead of just those 30- and 40-yard bombs, which right. – is where the other guys had most of their success. You know, they didn't have the cons- they didn't have the consistency of moving the ball as well yeah. as JT probably did yesterday. And now I, there's always the big debate: Jack Sears, JT Daniels. A lot of people like Jack Sears. There are throws that Jack Sears still misses that I see. You know, there's a play yesterday. There was a swing route where he waited to try to lob it over the defense and gave the safety time to come over and, and hit the running back. Whereas if he reads and sees that the running back was open short, throw it to him. He had the angle. He could have made it. And then he had a one-on-one move against the safety at the, at the line. There's throws that are still you're just like, ah, I wish he had – he probably thinks the same thing. I wish I had that one back. I would do this differently. There was a throw in the middle of the practice week that was just – he had a guy wide open over the middle, and he threw it and two feet in front of his feet, and there was nobody there. Yeah. It's like those, those are the throws you can't miss on. And I don't know that people, you know, from our tweets and what they see, they can – tell that whereas JT I think he's more consistent with his passes and he hits guys now JT has had some interceptions this this fall now some of those have been tip passes I mean he's he's been the the uh, the whatever the opposite of the beneficiary is my vocab <laughs> missing me right here but he's been the uh, been fallen to those where balls have tipped up where guys you know even pass interference plays that aren't called ball gets tipped up and a guy takes it the other way and people are like oh my god he's throwing so many interceptions because we're going to tweak those out yeah. and give credit to the defensive guys but I think he's just been more consistent this fall camp than Jack Sears has been, than either of the other two quarterbacks has been. And, you know, Matt Fink, I thought he is, he's made some throws. You know, there, there have been some, some camp pretty throws, throws yeah. that yeah. he's threaded the needle on. But the problem for Matt Fink is he's a redshirt junior. Are you going to hand the ball over to the redshirt junior that has no experience, basically, and say, okay, well, we want you to be the quarterback for the next two years? Or if you're even with everybody and say all four guys are even – are you going to hand it over to a younger guy and say, okay, now you get three or four years in this offense, or you know, you get two years, or you get three years if you're you're Jack Sears? Why would you give it to an older guy? Like if you're playing a video game and your guys are rated very similarly, you play the younger guy because right, you yeah. know he's going to get better as his career progresses. So for Matt Fink, unfortunately for him, you know, he came back after looking at transferring. He needed to beat out everybody, yeah. in my opinion. In my opinion, he needed to beat out everybody and be uh, up above everybody if he was going to win the job. And I don't think he's done that. Yeah, yeah best he's been close to the other guys. Yeah, I think a really good point, just real quickly on that. If you look at the numbers, too, JT Daniels has been getting more passes. He did get one extra series than the other guys. He got one. With, there was a bunch of walk-ons in that last series that Shotgun said was cut short. But a lot of it is he's moving the ball like you want to see this offense move the ball. If you remember last year, the, all the success was like hero plays all or nothing. And some of the other quarterbacks, that's they're still kind of doing that. I think all of them benefited from like throwing it up in the one-on-one coverage, the DB not making a play. Uh, JT Daniels had one of those on like a third and long to Eric Cromanhoek that he went, uh, you know, he went over uh, Greg, Greg Johnson, Johnson for, yeah. for, a, for a touchdown. But we see Michael Pittman make a ridiculous play, saving, saving a drive for one of the quarterbacks. But JT Daniels was moving the ball more efficiently, picking up first downs along the way. And that's why he was getting more pass attempts. It wasn't all like incomplete, incomplete bomb. It was, you know, moving the ball, moving the ball, moving the ball. And I, I, I think you're exactly right. I think he did a much better job of doing that than the other quarterbacks. And ultimately, that's how you want this offense to run. It's not just about 
big plays. You want to pick, you want to get some of those, but you want to be able to consistently move the ball. I think he's shown the best ability to do that so far. And I want to say that shows a little bit of development on his part because what did Graham Harrell say in the, in the spring is that he was taking too long to make decisions. He was thinking too much, and now he's taking those quick passes, going, going, and moving the ball down the field. Yeah. So, you know, I think that from that in particular, that one thing, I think that's something Graham Harrell was looking for. So I think that leads me to believe that he's ahead in the race, too. Nice. Yeah, I would have to agree. We actually have a live caller on Sweet. the line. Let's go to that uh, pretty soon here. Um, well, we got a lot of people watching. Nice. Thanks for everyone watching, everybody. <laughs> Hello, you're on live with Tunnel Vision. Hey, how's it going? Hi, how you doing? Can you hear me? Yes. Pretty good. Um, so my question is, after the showcase, do you, one, do you think it was a success? And two, what are your um, what are your feelings towards the team uh, afterwards? Are you more excited or less or the same? Or what do you think? What's your name, caller? <laughs> uh, Jesus. Jesus, where are you calling from? From Solis, California. Ah, oh, nice. Okay, Jesus. So... Do you guys think? I think it was pretty positive coming from there. Like I said, we haven't seen a lot of scrimmages and things like this where you actually got to watch a whole first team and a whole second team go. It was ones versus ones, twos versus twos the entire time, uh, eighty plays or so. We, you know, there was definitely some something left to be desired at, at certain points. But overall, I think it was a a pretty good success. I don't think. I think I went in there wanting to see more from the running game, and I didn't get to see that. So it's not like I'm going to walk out of there and go, yeah, they're going to be able to run the football. Um, I like the talent for the first five or six guys in the offensive line. I like the running back talent. But the only confidence on the, in the offense right now really is the passing game is going to be, I think, really, really good. But I just don't have any confidence otherwise. I don't know what, what you guys think. I thought it was a really good event. Like I said in, in the open is that – it was great for the fans to be able to see what they were able to see in this, and they were able to kind of check out the new digs of the Coliseum, get the autographs. You know, there's some things for the kids as well. And I think those are all positives, especially when you're coming off a five and seven season. You want to get the fan base back, you know, kind of in the flow, get some momentum going towards the season. You know, before you play Fresno State and Stanford, I think it was a great idea to have this. Getting the Coliseum, the tower open for for tours would have been huge. I think I think that's a big thing. I, I know they're going to try to. You know, I was talking with a USC spokesperson. They're going to try to do something for fans that want to come and tour. They're trying to figure out exactly what they can do. Um, I re I offered a pep rally. Just have a giant pep rally before a Fresno State game. Good Why idea. Not? Yeah. Yeah. We'll go for that. Uh, but you know, I think that there's some big question marks still with this team. You know, I have some question marks in the offense that I thought would be answered by now that still have not. But there are also some some big positives to come out of this. The defensive line, I think, is is playing really well. The guys on the edges, particular yeah. with Drake Jackson, I think he's pushing Christian Rector to be even better. I think Rector's going to have a big season. I think Drake Jackson's going to be a star at USC. I think guys like Abdul Malik McLean is showing he can get to the quarterback. Mm -hmm. It's all he does basically. <laughs> just throw him out there and just let him yeah. get to the quarterback. That's what he did in high school. That's what he's done so far at USC when he's been given some opportunities. You know, I think there's some positives come out of it. A lot of young guys in the secondary. That's still another concern. I know Clay Helton said that's one of his biggest concerns still, but... Probably the biggest concern right now would be that. But yeah. it, it's... Secondary, you said? I would yeah, think so. The, the young yeah. guys in the secondary. There was the Amon Ra that you were talking about that, that finished off a Keaton Slovis drive where he was over oh, behind Slovis. everybody. Okay, yeah. Most of the time, the, besides the, the, first team, the first string guys were there when the plays were made. You know, Tyler Vaughn's made a really nice catch over ITS. You know, uh, Chris Steele... Michael Pittman made two catches over him. The only time you saw guys getting behind DBs was the second or third team guys. You know, okay. when you had those young, you know, inexperienced cornerbacks. I think Chris Steele's right in the mix with that group already. So I, I think that there's some positive things to take away, even though they gave up some big throws and big plays. I think they were right there with the, the first string guys were at least. Yeah. Yeah. The irony is that I, Clay Helton said that he we'd see a lot of growth from the offensive line and, and he's seen it as well. And then he said that there'd be growing pains with the, the DBs, the cornerbacks. I, to me, it's kind of flipped. I think that we've seen growth from the cornerbacks and I'm still concerned about the offensive line. So I think that's what it kind of came out for me. But like I said, like you guys said, the wide receivers, they're going to be studs this season. I think for me, it kind of solidified that JT will probably be the guy. There hasn't been that much separation, but he passes the eye test in this offense and making those quick decisions. Um, but yeah, it because <laughs> people thought we were pretty negative when we were first talking about the offensive line in the fall showcase. They were like, oh no, we're doomed. But there were still positives to take away out of the, the fall yeah. showcase. Yeah, and Clay Helton said that it's the most improved group. I don't know if I buy that for the offensive line is what he was saying. Yeah. I'm not sure. 
I mean, you got to be able to run the ball if you want to say that they're the most improved group. But that, you know, that might just be just what he's. That's what he's projecting. That's what he wants wants it to be. Yeah, I don't know if it is yet. We'll see. Uh, Thanks for the call, Jesus. Yeah, thank you, Jesus, for the call. We have more callers. Shall we go to them? Sure, why not? Okay, we have another caller on the line. Hello, you're live on Tunnel Vision. What's your question? Hello? Hello. Hi, can you hear us? What's your name? Where are you from? What's your question? <laughs> hey. Yeah, my name is Josh, and I'm from San Antonio, Texas. Uh, my oh. question to you today is uh, what's, what's going on with Bru McCoy? I mean, uh I know we heard from uh, Clay Hilton talking about his, you know, he, he's being sick, you know, uh, about his fever and stuff like that. But what else have we, do you guys know about it? Thanks, Josh. Remember the Alamo? Uh, <laughs> he's from San Antonio. Oh, my goodness. Okay. He has to get that comment then, I guess. Just sure, why not? from San Antonio. Of course. Kill you, I do this one? Sure. So okay. I was told um, last week that there was hope that Brie McCoy would be able to play this week, uh, starting after Wednesday, because that was when Brie McCoy would have finished his meds. Uh, but the big key to all of that was that his fever, Brie McCoy's fever, would go away. And that's been the real problem, is that he'll have a fever, he'll feel bad, it'll kind of subside, he'll feel better, and then it'll come back. So he's... He's seen a lot of specialists. They are not sure what is really going on with Brew. There's a lot of frustration just from the Brew side of things because he wants to be out there. I know people have been like, oh, he's getting cold feet. That's not – he actually is sick, and they're trying to figure it out. Um, Clay Helton did say that he's getting better. Uh, he's been able to do some team meetings. I think he said he even did the John Baxter special teams constitution in front of the whole team uh, this week. But – they thought they were on the right track to get Brew back and healthy, but it doesn't look like that's the case right now. It's still a question mark as to what's really plaguing him. Um, but for as any case, his NCAA waiver is still undecided, and it looks like it probably won't be uh, granted for him to play or be eligible this season. So uh, I know people are really concerned about Brew, but for the most part, you're not going to probably see him play this season. So they're just trying to make sure that everything's – taken care of as far as his health. They don't want to rush him back until they know exactly what's wrong with him and, and how he can uh, be cured or fixed from whatever is plaguing him. Yeah. And Josh, thanks for the call, Josh. Um, yeah, I mean, I think people are skeptical because, you know, no one's really gone to a program, transferred out, transferred back before even you know, now, you know, he's out with this mysterious illness, but it does seem like there's really the mysterious illness. It's not like Oh, he really wants to go back to Texas. It's a, I know people are worried about different things, but I, I think it really just happens to be, it's a weird coincidence, but now he's hes dealing with something that's very strange as well. So yeah. the transfer stuff was very strange, and then this is this is very strange. His next step may be to go on the TV show House. You know, he may be a character. <laughs> Dr. House. Yeah. Uh, Dr. House will figure it out. Maybe a case for him. But thanks for the call, Josh. We're getting more calls now that people are calling in. I think someone had to be the first sacrificial call, and then oh. people are like, oh, I can do it too. <laughs> um, let's go to, I believe it's Rick on the line. Hello, you're on the line with Tunnel Vision. Hi, how you doing? Good. What's your question for um, the team? My name is Rick. Okay, I was there yesterday, and I enjoyed my time. Um, my question is, how uh, do you have faith in the op the CB spot opposite Elijah Griffin? I just love Elijah Griffin and his like energy, his enthusiasm, and so I think he has one side locked up. I just want to know who has the edge opposite him with ITS, with Chris Steele. I know he was in there, and he was playing really hard. Who do you have uh, as, as the edge? It's interesting that you say that. Thanks for the call, by the way. But it's interesting that you say that because Elijah Griffin has kind of been the odd man out practicing with the second team. You know, he had a you know, great first week and a half. He had, I think, five interceptions, six interceptions. But he's been the guy that's been with the second team. It's been mostly Isaac Taylor Stewart and Chris Steele getting the first team reps. Greg Johnson has been nicked up, but he's kind of been in and out with the first team. Nickelback, some different, yeah. you know, different looks there. And they've moved a lot of guys around. This second week, uh, second full week of fall camp, they moved a lot of guys. We talked about it with the offensive line. They also did it with the DBs. You've seen Chase Williams. You know, he moved from the starting nickelback spot to playing a starting safety spot. Talano Hufungo, which we all expect to start, was playing with the second team at times. So there's been a lot of mixing and matching, but I don't know that Elijah Griffin is at that starter spot yet. You know, I think he's probably behind just looking at what we've seen and how much he's played with the second string that he's in the coach's eyes probably in that second group right now. Now, obviously, still two weeks left to camp, yeah. and those are the probably 
some of the most highly competitive positions on the field right now. The nickelback spot and whether Greg Johnson plays there or Chase Williams, the cornerback spots where Greg Johnson is he out there or is it ITS? Is it Elijah Stewart? I mean, Elijah Griffin, is it, you know, uh, is it um, – Chris Steele, you know, there's a lot of options there, and there's, you know, there's five or six guys in battle for those basically three positions, those three different cornerback spots. So we'll see how it kind of plays out. But I don't know that Elijah Griffin has locked it up. I would say that, you know, we've liked what we've seen, and he's an ultra. So the, the question then in my mind is, what do the coaching staff want? Because Isaac Taylor Stewart is oftentimes right there with the receiver, but doesn't get the big plays, doesn't get the interception. But he's always there. He's going to be, you know, he either knocks it away or he makes the tackle. He's not giving up the big play over the top. Elijah Griffin, on the other hand, is very aggressive. He's super aggressive. He will go and he'll get the interceptions, but then he'll also occasionally get burned deep because he jumps something and there's a double move or whatever it may be. You know, you saw last year when he was guarding California, Vic Wharton gets by him. You know, they were jawing back and back and forth after he had broken up a pass. The very next play, they go deep and they beat him. Yeah. And he gets beat. Now he's a freshman. And he's only gotten a certain amount of, you know, a little bit of playing time last year. And then, you know, he missed all the spring the first time he ever had to sit out. So he had double uh, shoulder surgeries. So he's coming back off of that getting fully healthy, getting back in the groove. So we'll see where it kind of goes. But right now, I don't think he's necessarily in that first group. I'm going to agree with Rick. I think I'd be shocked if he wasn't the starter. So I think they're mo they're trying a lot of different things now. But if he's not starting day day one, I, I just call me shocked. I think he's going to be one of those guys. Then who do you think's on the other side? What's, I don't know. Yeah. I, think, I think they're still trying to figure that out, too. But I, I feel like, uh, you know, ITS probably will be that guy because you're right. I mean, he doesn't seem to get beat, but he's just not making some of those plays. I mean, he was right there. Like, guys have made ridiculous catches on top of him, you know? Like, it's, it's one of those things. But he's there. Are you always going to have that happening? But I, I just think Elijah Griffin is going to make – he's going to be a playmaker out there for you, and uh, I think there's good risk-reward with him. But we'll, we'll see how it plays out. But it's a really – there's so many young guys, there's not a lot of experience, so I think almost anything can happen in the secondary. I also think you'll see, especially that first game, second game maybe, even third, fourth game, that those guys are all going to get opportunities. Yeah. You know, they're going to, okay, if, if Elijah Griffin starts, then ITS or whoever it is, he's coming in the third drive of the game, whatever. He gets two drives, and then you bounce it back and forth, and whoever's playing the best down the stretch, that's you, you know, I think that might be the case. I think they have confidence in that whole group of you know those that first team group the, of the guys that have been in that first team so i think that you know those guys will all get opportunities and see how they play in the games yeah i think it's going to be trial by fire and whoever uh, progresses the most grows the most under that fire that pressure will then start to to solidify their starting spot uh, but thank you for the call rick yeah, guys right. we're getting a lot of calls right now do we want to do some other questions too or i feel bad if they're on the line maybe we should just grab them you know, yeah like, maybe uh we'll try to make these answers a little bit shorter I'll yes, try. yes i'll yes. try okay i think we have john on the line we're about to have john on the line hello you're on tunnel vision yes we do <laughs> yes hi guys how you guys doing today Good, Good, John. How are you? Where are you from? Hello. I am from Glendora, California. Oh, nice. The home um, of the and I am Peaks. a long, yep, I'm a long time season ticket holder. And all I can say is I, uh, I just have a quick question. Is why I've been, I, I see that I was at the game yesterday, this fall showcase. I get to see the difference in the players' eyes compared to last season. Last season, the players would walk by you with their head down. They didn't care. They didn't have a swagger to them. This time you can see the field of difference. Just then the energy was different. The, the, their size was bigger for sure. Um, they look like an older SC team. Interesting. Would you agree? Yeah, no, I think that's a really good point. And, you know, we had a few weeks back, we had Aaron Osmus sitting right here talking about, you know, lifting heavy and eating thick. And um, we've seen that out there. I think it's, you know, is bench pressing you know, a whole bunch more and squatting a whole bunch more and making you a better football player? I don't know. But the guys are a lot more confident. I think they're more physical. They feel stronger. I think you know their, their bodies have changed. I think it's helped their confidence overall. So if you see their heads up and not moping around, you know, maybe that changes if you lose a couple of games. But I would agree. I think that's a, that's a good observation. Yeah, and hope springs eternal. You know, in the, Usually it's in spring for baseball. But in fall, hope springs eternal during fall camp. You will see if they if they start out two and four or something. If if your head's still up then, yeah. Or you know you got to get out and you got to play well. If you play well, you gain confidence and continue. With last year, obviously, they were not playing well, and that makes it much easier to be disappointed and, and uh, be down. Yeah. 
I'm curious just how, you know, sometimes when guys who've been strongholds in their position uh, graduate, if it changes the dynamic. And I talked to Chase Williams for a little bit about it, about the defense and the, specifically the defensive backs. And he said that they seem closer this year. Uh, they seem more together. They're communicating more. Uh, they talk about football in a group chat together more, you know, stuff like that. So I, it's curious to see if, you know, if you have an Iman Marshall leave, a Cam Smith leave, other guys can kind of step up and take those uh, reins of leadership, if that changes the dynamic at all. It's something that you'll see develop over the course of the season, whether or not it works or not. So we shall see. But yeah. thanks for the call, John. Uh, we have one more, and then we're going to go to questions from other people. Yeah. So, Shotgun, get ready to we're, have those ready. <laughs> we got plenty. Uh, but let's go to, I believe, Chris is on the line. Hello. Hi. Hi. How's everybody doing? Good. Good, Chris. Where are you from? Glendora. I know that was from Glendora. Wow. Ah. You guys should just watch Tunnel Vision together. Have yeah. a watch party. <laughs> No, we need the ratings. Watch separately. <laughs> yeah, true. Watch yeah. separately. Never mind. <laughs> the ratings. <laughs> but uh, I have a question. First off, oh, I have an observation. I thought Matt Fink played really well yesterday. Yeah. I was actually really surprised because I didn't think he was that good last year. But uh, he looked really good. In that, and he th had a nice, beautiful throw. I, I'm not sure if it was to Amon Ra or Bayless, but it, it was nice. And yeah. so I really um, – was actually impressed with him yesterday, but uh, I, 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 I was I was there yesterday and I was very uh, discouraged about the run game. Now I just want to see if you guys think is that because our defense is really good or we just not a very uh, we're not going to run the ball that well this year. Yeah, uh, thanks for the call. I think we kind of went over this a, a little bit earlier. But... Yeah, I did. So I'll let you take this. <laughs> no, it, I mean I think it's a legitimate concern uh we both like the personnel we like the depth we like the way the new defensive front has looked um i think they've made it tougher i think if you're you know if you're a hope you're hopeful usc fan that maybe you're gonna see some different defenses that aren't putting four four linemen up there near the line of scrimmage they're gonna try to stop the air raid i mean they they did whatever they wanted in the passing game i think if you're if you're an offensive you know you're an offensive coach and the passing game's working, you're not as concerned if the run game isn't working. If if it's the opposite, where, hey, you can run the ball at will, but you can't really throw the ball, oh, well, just keep running the ball. So it's one of those things where the passing game works so well, maybe you don't want to get too down on the run game because, you know, they just didn't do it all that much. But it's certainly an area of concern. There's going to be situations where you have to try to pick up some yards on the ground. And we just haven't seen it through camp. Even you know, even in the spring, it's not something that's been evident. Like, oh yeah, we can see how they're going to be able to run the ball. It's sort of been this wait and see thing. Yesterday would have been a good time to see it, and we didn't. So, uh, it might we might not know until the games come where they're they're really putting those situations, and you can just take off and and run. We know the short yards with Marquis Step that'll work, but are you going to be able to you know between the twenties be able to run the football, pick up four or five yards on first down, and you know get ahead of the change? We just haven't seen that yet. Yep. Alrighty, thanks for the call. We have cleared out our call logs right now. Um, <laughs> thanks for all the calls. This is great. Like we haven't done this for a couple of weeks, and uh, to get all these people, hundreds of people watching online live yeah. and everything, it's, we really appreciate it. Thank you. Guys. As I said, that we just got a caller, but caller, you're gonna have to wait for a little bit. <laughs> uh, Shotgun, I know that we have many questions waiting in the queue. How about you serve some up for us? Yeah, we got a lot of questions from YouTube. Thanks you guys for sending your questions, your calls, everything. Uh, glad you guys could join us tonight. Start with Andrew. He said, "How much did USC show yesterday? Was it all out for everybody to see?" You know, I don't think they showed everything, but as the whole talk was, you know, they could implement the entire offense, install it all in three practices. Then I don't think it's too much. There's not too much to show, anyways. Yeah. You know, there's probably some trick plays or something that'll be in their up their sleeve. But you know, I don't think any of that would be shown. You know, unless they were just trying to show it for the fans for fun. But you're not going to show it all. But also, it wasn't televised or anything. We had some questions about that. You know, yeah. if there was film of it, you know, we weren't allowed to shoot we any film. We weren't allowed to film. They didn't show it live. It wasn't anything like that. Keely and I were able to be down on the field for the first 20 minutes, which was their stretching, their warming up period. As soon as they were, they lined up to kick the first uh, kick off the ball for the first time. We were shoot off the field by some random guys that I've never seen before. But they're like, "Nope, gotta go, gotta go, gotta." <laughs> so you know, there was no film of it or anything. So we have they, some pictures from the work, the stretch. Yeah. That so we you know, we were able to see a little bit. You know, I oh, mean, but I don't think that they were trying to show everything per se. But I don't think that there is a ton for them to show. Now there might have been some blitzes and stuff on the defensive side that they weren't showing. But again, 
We talked about when Graham Harrell came in. We're going to install this offense in three days, and that's what they did. With Clancy Pendergast on the other side, Clay Hilton said, hey, we need you to simplify things, and everybody said, said that they have. So to an extent, there's not too much for USC to show, per se, versus hold stuff back because everything's supposed to be a little bit simpler this year. Yeah. So that's going to be a question mark when you know when you get to game three, four, five of the season, and if you, you're not – adding new stuff every week, is it going to be something where a team's like, okay, we know exactly what they're doing here. and what they're here. On the offensive side, not so much. Because like I said previously and wrote about, the, the wide receivers, you know, it may be a four verticals play call, and there might be 15 to 20 different options off that because each – receiver can run you know four or five different routes based on what the defense is giving them so the, the part of this offense they have to figure out is getting everyone on sync in sync yeah. and everyone knows when a quarterback knows exactly when a, this receiver turns his shoulders one way or the other that's when he can throw the ball yeah. you know those type things which is and why so, you want to pick a starting quarterback that would help yeah so that's that's what we have there andrew you know right. it showed some things thanks andrew Ryan wants to know, can we see a Notre Dame-like bounce back after hiring a new offense coordinator or strength and conditioning coach that made a big difference in the offseason so far? And USC's S&P ranking, which if you guys are into advanced stats, was way better than their actual record last year, much like Notre Dame's was in 2016. Yeah. I hate that comparison, though. Um, just there was sort of – it seemed more like you a – You mean the co- Lynn Swan comparison of it and Clay Helton comparison? Yeah, I just didn't really like – I mean, I think I think this team is going to turn things around uh, because with the way USC was, USC <clears> was way too talented last year to be a five-game winner. That's why the S&P 500 was so much higher. I mean, they lost a bunch of games they shouldn't have lost. With 10-point um, leads and, or double-digit leads. Yeah, four games. times you had 10 points. They had a lead in – 10 of the, f- the 12 games in the first quarter, and the two games they didn't have a lead, they had they ended up going up 14 nothing in the second quarter. So it was. I'm glad you agree my stats. Yeah. I appreciate it. Nice. <laughs> was that, did you write that? Or I no? did. Oh, okay. I don't know where that came from. I think but. Dan talked about it as well. Yeah. Um, I'm glad you all can read my stats. The good <laughs> stats, guys, I'm just saying. Um, and, and this, since we just brought up Lynn Swan, you know, it was asked, was he there yesterday? Yes, he was there. He was pointing out things to Marvin Pollard and Willie McGinnis on the field. I had a picture of that. But when you look at the Notre Dame thing, it, it's a different comparison because they changed more than just the offense coordinator and strength and condition. They changed basically everything yeah. on the coaching staff. There was like one or two guys that stayed. Whereas USC, they changed one or two guys on the actual coaching staff, and they changed a lot of support staff. And Lynn Swan tried to say on the Dan Patrick show, well, we changed 18, you know, we got 18 new coaches or something. Yeah, that was ridiculous. I don't know exactly how he phrased it, but he said there was 18 new. Now that's support staff, that's secretaries, that's recruiting staff. Yeah. That's that's not changing your coaching staff. Yeah. That's different. Yeah. And so if you make the comparison like they did, which is why we were, we were really harsh on them during the offseason when they said, you know, we want to be like Notre Dame. We think we can turn things around. But then you only changed a couple of things. You know, you moved some guys around, but Kerry Colbert's still there. He's not the tight ends coach anymore. Yeah. You know, and Jim Drevno's still there. He's not the running backs coach anymore. But you just moved some guys around. There weren't some big wholesale changes like Notre Dame did. So it's a hard comparison to say the same thing. But – like yeah. Ryan said, the s and you know, there's a lot of talent still on that team. Yeah. Uh, we have a Facebook question from Bob. He says, Ryan, are you still predicting 10 more points per game with this offensive line? Uh, yeah. No, I think they're going to – I mean, I don't know. It's good. it's not going to have the balance that maybe some USC fans would want, but they're going to score more points. Like this – the receiver group is redonkulous. Like they are really good. Like Devin Williams, like do you even like – oh, yeah, he was like a stud yesterday. Tyler Vaughn's made a couple like – ridiculous catches. Michael Pittman, you see what he does. I'm on Ross A. Brown. And you're like, oh yeah, Valus Jones is on there, the team too. And, you know, we didn't even get to see much of Drake Jackson, yet, or Drake uh, London yesterday. And True. I love what he's able to do. Like, he's like, going to be a red zone nightmare. He can beat guys off the line of scrimmage and go up and rebound and catch balls. I mean, the, the wide receiver group is is studly. They're going to put up a lot more points. They, they left so many points on the table last year. Really just Going from incompetent to competent, you're going to score more points. So, yes, I still I still think 10 points more per game. So it will be 35, 36 points a game. And if you guys read the War Room, if you're subscribers, you know, our insider information that comes out every Friday morning, they, there are some high expectations for that offense from that offensive room. So, you know, they want to put up a lot of points on the board. We'll see if it happens. They want more than, what, 36. So And if you read the War Room, you would have a Brew McCoy update as well. So just nice. if you want your information, that's where to get it. Yeah, thanks, Bob. Shotgun? Going back to me. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Super OC Holmes. He said, did the team have a fun bonding day like Carol used to do, i.e., uh, you know, AVP at Manhattan Beach, the movie premiere, or Lindale White stunt? 
Well, Clay Helton's done those things. They had paintball last year. But you know what happens? Everybody on the message board freaks out yeah, and says, oh, my it. God, you can't do things that are not hitting people every day. You can't have fun ever. No so, ice cream. No, yeah. So the... even if they did have that this year, it's probably not going to be publicized as much as it was previously because yeah. people freak out for no reason. You can this, do that when you're winning and it looks cool. If you're losing, then it, it's They were looks coming like off of a good season, you yeah. know? So what does it matter if they went paintballing? They didn't. They didn't take a day of practice away. Right. Yeah. It's something they add instead. Uh, people freak out for no reason. Obviously. Yeah. But they've I done to some like question. I think they've done some beach barbecues. Like Aaron Osmus, that you're, he's showing pictures of them like grilling steaks and stuff all the time. Like I think he's he's added a different element to this. So he's definitely more. Re he's relating to the kids a lot more, and he believes everything he's preaching. We talked about that in, in the war room and stuff too. So there it's, yeah, I, I think there's some fun, positive things going on. And like the other caller said, like, there's just a different attitude now. I think they're, they're a lot more confident right now. Lifting heavy, eating thick. Yeah. Eating Gotta get them thick. steaks in. Lift. Jasper wanted to know uh, from an injury standpoint, who won't be ready to go for the opener? As of right now, we basically have four names, I believe, you know, Jordan Iacefa, Elijah Winston, Solomon Tulialapupu, which is notable because all three of those are middle inside linebackers. Yeah. And then Jacob Lichtenstein, Clay said he'd be back in two weeks this past week. So he'd be back. You know, he would start practicing basically the week of the game. So I doubt yeah. he would be able to play at all either. If I, am I missing out on anybody? Well, Vi Malapai has a turf toe, right? So curious we're, we're about him. Sure. Though, I thought that was a knee for He's Vi. Knee. Oh, it's a knee. Okay. Yeah. Who and is the turf toe? Uh, Elijah Winston. Uh, Elijah and Winston Henry and Henry. Yeah. And then Kyle Ford, probably. We saw him do some stuff Good at the point. beginning of camp, but Clay said that his ACL is kind of a, his knee's not there yet. So they, they took him off rehab duty and have him just watching practice right now. I Max would, Williams also I would say the three practice. ACL guys, you know, are still. Still not going to be in there yeah. to start with. That would be Max Williams, Kyle Ford, and Ethan Ray. Now, Max Williams, though, is a hamstring. It's not his but knee He's, he's in particular. still an ACL guy. Yes. I, until he yes. gets back and is a full participant, you know, I just don't think they're going to rush those guys back just because ACL injury, right. you don't want to have a recurrence or anything of it. So I think those three guys are probably still out, too. Obviously, Brew McCoy is out. Let's just go ahead and answer this. There's a lot of questions in YouTube about his eligibility. He still has an NCAA – whether or not he is healthy, you know, if he, even, if he comes back and – He's completely cured tomorrow. He still is not eligible to play as of right now. Yeah. Yeah. He has to get a – he has sent in a waiver. USC has sent in a waiver on his behalf to the NCAA asking him to be immediately eligible, even though he transferred from Texas. If you transfer from a school, NCAA rules say you have to sit out a year. So as an undergraduate transferring, he's sitting out that year unless he gets his eligibility – a waiver uh, approved by the NCAA. That happened with Chris Steele. He transferred from Florida. He is immediately eligible. So Brew McCoy will not be eligible to play unless the NCAA says he will be. So that it doesn't matter about the four games. There's the questions red about rule, this. Yeah. You know, it, that, that's a red shirt rule that doesn't matter. If you're not approved, you're not approved. Yeah. Okay. We had a Periscope one. I know there's been a lot of Periscope activity. Real quick, uh, it's OKG. Do you guys feel Valus will have a more significant role in the offense this year. And you also want to know the timetable for Vi's return, which we just kind of talked about. But thanks for uh, the question. It's OKG. Okay, I don't know that we've got an update on when Vi would return. Clay said Did I miss that this week that he was day-to-day -day and hopeful to return this week. He kind of lumped in Brandon Peely and Vi Malpei together as far as returning this past week. Now, Brandon Peely did return. He Vi did. did not. And Vi's still doing rehab stuff. He's not even doing full pad you know, matching the team's level of uniform and doing rehab on the sidelines. So I don't know if that's concerning or not, or not at this point because Clay did put him on a faster timeline than we've seen. Um, so that's something that you should watch for. And what about Valus Jones? Like, you know, he missed the spring, which set him back a little bit. But, you know, coming back from uh, the transfer portal. But he's he's made a lot of nice plays out there. I think he's running well. He's got, you know, Dan says he has better balance than, be, than he had before. I think I agree with that. Uh, but, yeah, I think he can play a significant role. I, I think that he's going to be the vertical threat, the stretch the field threat that they don't necessarily have with Pittman or Vaughn's. Like, those guys can make those big catches on the outside, but they're not stretching the defense like he's going to be able, running up the middle and pushing yeah. those safeties back, which opens up that 15-yard window for – Tyler Vaughn's or Michael Pippen to come inside or a tight end. So I think he, he adds a different element that they didn't have without him in the spring. So I think he plays a big role. I don't know that, you know, there would be some deep balls there and hopefully he catches some of those, you know, because a couple times last year he ended up right near the end zone a couple times, like the Texas game and yeah. uh, the Arizona game, I think. Yeah, he was so State. close to getting his touchdown. 
he finally got one in Arizona State. But I think that – I don't know how, how his numbers will change this year. I think he might have some, some big numbers, but with low catches. I think his – his, uh, his yards per catch may be way up there because they'll use him as that, that stretch the field threat. Right. Yeah, agreed. I think he's just taking a step up in general. I think we've seen growth from him. Uh, he's a he's a more mature type of receiver. And, and that's surprising given that he, he, he missed all the spring and is coming in fresh in the fall. Uh, we have a Facebook question from Louise. He says, is there anyone you may have noticed really stepping up in the spring that has continued through fall camp? Trey Jackson is the immediate name that steps out. Yeah. I mean, he's just been – he's been a beat. He's a guy that's going to start – I don't know if he's going to start. He's going to play a big role as a freshman. Yeah. Uh, and he's going to continue to get better and better. So, you know, he's really stood out to me. Any football yeah. per person that you know looks at him and goes, if he's not playing, that's a problem. So he's <laughs> he's definitely going to play. He He's the he's the obvious one. Um, ben Griffiths, like, you yeah. know, him, like, booming putts. He had, like, a 58-yarder or something yesterday. So – I. It's just one of those things you see him in person. I think people, a lot of people were tweeting like, oh, I see what you're saying. Like, yeah, that guy's ridiculous. Like, yeah, he is. Yeah. He got claps for one of his punts too. Yeah. Which was, Who claps for a punt? Hey, if it's good enough, yeah. you, can, you can clap. Yeah. Uh, we got a question from SNS Productions. He says, does Greg Johnson look a lot better in at the nickel position or is, it, is he better at the cornerback position? And how much growth have you seen from him? You know, again, the question, or not again, this was brought up in our podcast. The question with that nickel back spot is what do you want out of it? And talking to Greg Burns this past week, he, I was talking to him about that position. He says he's looking, they're looking for utility out of that position. Can they blitz? Can they be a uh, edge rusher, you know, ed, coming off the edge as a blitzer? Can they hold the edge in the run game? Can they be a tackler up there and contribute in that? But then also drop back and cover tight ends. And, you know, they're asking a lot from that nickel back position. So that that becomes a question. Can whoever you put there, can they do all the things you want to do? Or do you have to limit your defense to an extent? Because, you know, like I, I use the example that Ajene Harris was really good at the cornerback spot, but Ajene Harris coming up and he was a willing tackler, but he wasn't a good tackler. So he's not a guy you want to send up there and try to tackle, a, a, you know, a 230-pound running back because he was 170 pounds at, at most. So, you know, that's not just not a good matchup. Whereas Chase Williams and Greg Johnson are thicker guys. They're willing to come up and hit and stuff like that. So those are – it's kind of a question mark of what you want out of that position as to who I think has played better there. Um, I, I think Greg Johnson's only been there for a few practices, so it's kind of hard to say. And he also got nicked up this week. So it's kind of hard to say where he fits better right at this point, I think. Yeah, I, I just kind of like Chase Williams at that the nickel spot better, you know, and just and figure out where you want to do with Greg Johnson. But I, I like Chase there. Um, you know, Isaiah Polamau and uh, Talano Hufunga at the safety spot. I feel that's pretty good, and you can rotate those other three guys at corner. But that, that's just my opinion. Uh, we have a question from Alan on Facebook. He says, does the defense have a defensive set or are they mixing it up a lot? Seems like 5-2 or nickel would fit the personnel. There's going to be a ton of nickel. They always use a ton of nickel in yeah. the Clancy Pendergrass. He, I asked him one time what he would prefer to have on the field. This is a couple years ago now, but he said he would rather speed. have speed yeah. on the field. So, and especially when the offenses you're facing out here on the West Coast in the Pac-12, a lot of spread offenses, you know, from the Mike Leaches to even the Chip Kellys, you need to have somebody who can run and and tackle someone front, you know, they may have to run a long distance. So instead of – there's not many Stanfords left in the world of college football. So in that, you'll they'll run more 5-2 then. They'll do some some different jumbo packages against Stanford. But against everybody else, you're going to see the nickel a lot. Yeah, They've done some different things with the four – they're going to have four guys in the front. It looks like 4 2 5 was a lot yeah. what they ran yesterday. So they, that, that, Which is what they ran. They've been running for the entire time Clancy's come back. It's just – these, it was a different feel, though. It the wasn't four, like, yeah. the four may be the four with, felt like four up front as well, opposed the, to like you know roaming somewhere. You know, well, the no, the, the four always. You always had Porter, Dustin, <laughs> and Uchenna Nwosu yeah. attacking the quarterback, right? They were that was that was the outside two guys. Their four are going to go forward. Yeah. And the question is, are they going to put their hand on the ground or are they going to stand up? That's yeah. the biggest question. There, it's still going to be a lot of four two five in that regard. But we'll see some different things with their quote unquote. I don't know why they call it their base, having three down linemen yeah, and two outside linebackers or whatever, having five guys in the front. But they call that their base, even though they use it like 6% yeah. of the time. <laughs> uh, we had a lot of questions about the tight ends and how they will be used in this offense and this season. What are you guys' opinion? What happened to our phone call? I don't know what oh, we got to get to that, too. Uh, <laughs> oh, we have more phone calls, yes. <laughs> uh, uh, I talked to Josh Follow yeah. the last practice, and uh, he's, you know, just look at him, looking at him, He's a mismatch for any defense. I think he's going to be like a nightmare. Uh, they still have their hand on the ground sometimes. Like, 
I don't know. I mean, they didn't seem to be helping with the run game all that much uh, yesterday, but they're going to be dynamic pass catchers. To have a guy like Aaron uh, Eric Kromenhoek uh, catch a touchdown yesterday, a little shocking. You don't really expect that from from him, you know, him being down the field like that. But I think they're going to be utilized in the passing game significantly. How much are they going to be used, like run blocking and stuff? You know, Josh said they're, they're, his duties are almost the same as before. Um, so we'll see how, how they kind of uh, use that. Are they on the field all that much? Do they have their hand on the ground uh, sometimes? Uh, are they just going to be kind of slot guys? But a guy like Follow, he's so athletic. He's big, you know, big hands that he can catch anything. Um, I really think you, you know, he's too big. Uh, to go, you know, for like a safety to cover him or a cornerback to cover him. And he's too fast for a linebacker. So I, I think there's a, a really good way you can get him in space and, and make uh, just really put pressure on the opposing defense. And they're going to use the tight ends and do different things. So you're going to use them as an H back. You know, you, they've even, you know, done some things where they're in the backfield to an extent. You know, like an H back would be moved around in different spots. So th they do different things in this offense with the tight end. So they're not just going to be hand on the ground beside the tackle every time. They're not right. going to be split out every time. They're going to use them in a variety of ways. Mm -hmm. yeah. And maybe who they use might depend on what position of, on the field they want to use that person. Uh, before we go to our calls, uh, someone, I think it was Josh on Facebook, asked if we're doing any tailgates this year, Ryan? Oh, yeah. So uh, the plan is right now we're going to do a big tailgate for the Stanford game. So the second game of the season uh, it's a late game. It's a 7.30 or 7.15, something like that game. So we're working on the details for that, getting like a parking plot. Hopefully it will be um, next to the Coliseum. So that would be kind of nice. Uh, so we'll, uh, we used to do these tailgates all the time, but we have to go into the games early and, and you know, work at the press box and stuff. So, and it's a lot of work, um, but we wanted to do one again. So we're going to, the, the, the goal is uh, for Stanford. Um, I will be, I'll be, I'm going to tailgate for the first game too for Fresno State, but that's going to be for the Trojan marching band. So Jake Olson, me and Jake Olson will be uh, speaking at that tailgate. So if you have a chance to go to the Art Bartner 50th uh, anniversary year tailgate for Fresno State, I'll be at that one too. But for USAFootball.com, the plan is uh, we're going to put it together for the Stanford game. So check, we'll, we'll share all the details as soon as we uh, finalize stuff. Yep. Good stuff there. Okay. Let's go to our callers. Uh, big thanks to, I believe it's Hugh. He's been waiting for 20 minutes. So you're live on Tunnel Vision, and thanks for waiting. <laughs> you're welcome. Thanks for doing this. Um, uh, so I'm Hugh from Steamy Valley. Uh, as a very long war room reader, oh. um, I uh, wanted to ask you a, a hard question. I know that uh, the athletic department wasn't exactly kind uh, in one of your reportings on how you guys reported last year, being I, what I would call, the rest of us would call honest. Um, in your objective you know, view. But here's my question, and I don't mean to throw you under the bus or have to do that, but if you guys were to move the season four weeks in, what would you see the storyline to be? Would it be a Clay Hilton storyline, a Lynn Swan storyline, the fact that USC is scoring 50 points a game, or some other storyline? I'd love to meet you. Thanks, Hugh. Um, Good question. Uh, really yeah. interesting. I mean, the problem is I think that the, those first four weeks are going to be so important, and they could go in any direction. <laughs> yeah. It could be a Lynn Swan thing. I mean, you talk to a lot of national writers. A lot, a lot of them feel he's going to be gone by the end of October. Now, so maybe not with the first four weeks. We haven't seen any indication <laughs> that Carol Fult, who we got to meet uh, this past week, um, really, really nice lady, yeah. uh, the president, you new president of USC. We haven't seen anything where, like, she's about to fire him, but that's – what a lot of the national pundits seem to think is going to happen. Um, so that would be interesting. I mean, I think Clay Hilton has to be a part of it because it's either going to be, oh, the team's two and two, and they got uh, upcoming games against Washington and Notre Dame on the road. Now you're looking at two and four in the face, and, uh, you know, wh what's the future of Clay Hilton? I think that's a, certainly a, a possibility. Or it's an exciting team that's scoring 50 points a game. If they get a big win against Stanford and a big win, against Utah, don't lose those out of conference games. Uh, I mean, that could be the, they could be the talk of the you know, national college football world if they start off four and oh, and they'll go on the road to Washington. And, and you know, it, like there's so many different yeah. ways for it to go. It's hard to pick, you know, one, my, my guess is going to be somewhere in the middle of that, but really I'll, it, it's all wide open for me. What do you think shotgun or Keely, whoever's ready? I mean, that's the thing is like <laughs> things can change so much in, in a month period in a college football season because a team can go six and oh, and you lose the next four games and yep. you go from, Oh, they're a national championship contender to this is the worst team ever at USC. I mean, that's, 
if USC was 6 0 and then did, went 0 4 the next four games th- this season. But that schedule, that's not going to happen this and year. I'm just saying, that would be the, the talk. It'd be like, oh my goodness, they're a national contender because they've beaten all these other teams oh. that, you know, they're 6 0. But then if they, somehow they go 0 4, they get some bad injury that sets them back or whatever. And then people are going, like, this, this it's. Clay Helton should be fired again if they were they went six and zero and then they lose four games in a row. You know that, that could be the st- case. So much can change in a, a month because every game is so important in a college football season. Yep. And when you have basically what I think are two games that will determine, you know, USC standing in the Pac-12. You know those the first two Pac-12 games this year, Stanford, Stanford. and Utah. against Utah, I think will determine their standing in the Pac-12 this year. They beat Utah, you know they've got a great chance of winning the South. If they beat Stanford, you know that puts them up. You know I, I think that there's a kind of a toss up. The Washington, Oregon, and Stanford games are like those are the three North games that are going to be tough. You know fight. You know who are you going to play in those games? I mean how are you going to do in those games? I think. The Stanford game gives you that momentum going forward if you win that game to, to go into that Utah game a couple weeks later. But I think those two games will determine how they do. So it's just hard to say because we still don't know. There's a lot of question marks about this team, about this coaching staff, about the offense still. I mean, there's just a lot of question marks to go. Yeah, yeah I think this is a cop-out, but I could see all three that he listed. You know, I, it's you don't know at this point, and it's going to be – Interesting to see how it all plays out. But thanks for the call, Hugh. We appreciate it. We appreciate you waiting as well. And another person who is waiting, I'm about to put on the line. Hello, you're on live with Tunnel Vision. Hey, guys. This is Jaeger from Burbank. Uh, Thanks for taking my call. Really, uh, Hugh kind of touched on what I wanted to get into, which is um, I'm looking forward to Clay having a chance to save his job this season because I like the guy and I don't want to watch another bad season. But is he in a position also to save Lynn Swan's job? And if Lynn Swan's on his way out, is Tim Tessalone going out too? Because that has to be the moron that told you guys not to live tweet the scrimmage, even though there's 10,000 fans in the crowd with cell phones and Wi-Fi. And uh, I'll hang up, but just to comment also, Keely, all I do is watch football, and I could not do what you do, so don't listen to the haters on Twitter. You're doing an absolutely outstanding job. So, Thank you. Thanks, guys. Take care. I appreciate it, Thanks, Jager. Jager. Yeah, nice. Um, I think there, there's a separation when Lynn's the, your football is obviously the bell cow of any pretty much any college program, some college basketball, Kansas, North Carolina. But for the most part, it's, it's football. And if football does well, that helps his cause. However, there are a lot of other things going on at USC in the athletic department, especially when there's multiple FBI investigations. And arrests, that, yeah. That – can determine your job. So USC could be doing really well, and I think Lynn Swan could still be can because of everything else that's going on in the athletic department. Yeah. The first losing season for football, basketball, and baseball in how many years? I remember, you know, that. 642, um, I think, the, since the since the medieval ages. The only, <laughs> the only, you know, program in the country to have two FBI investigations going on, you know, three arrests. The only uh, school in the whole – Varsity Blue scandal to have a you know a senior athletic administrator involved like there's there's been a lot of things that have not been positive that don't have anything to do with football. If the team starts out two and four, I don't think that's helping its cause. But I don't think if you know if Clay Helton turns things around and and they're winning a bunch of games, I'm not sure you know if they're going to get rid of him. It's probably going to be for a lot of the other things too. And plus, when you have a new boss in any job atmosphere. You know, you've got to impress that new boss. Yeah. So new bosses oftentimes want to put their own people in place. Yeah. Yep. Already, uh, it's eight seventeen. I believe we should go into rapid fire. Yeah. Uh, just to get things we going. Already? Okay. I mean, I mean, it's crazy. We, we a lot of people are watching, and we appreciate it. There's a lot to talk about at the start of the season, so uh, we'll probably get more questions answered in the tunnel visions to come just because we've gotten this out of the way. But shotgun, yeah. what do you have for us? If you could change one position group, Ryan Harvey asks. With any other Pac-12 school, what would that group be and why? Say that again. I completely missed if it. If you could change any one position group with another Pac-12 school, what would you? Which one would you change? Ooh. So if it's just for one season, I think my answer is pretty simple. I think I'm going with Washington's DBs. I would go Cal's know, DBs. Maybe. Oh yeah, Cal's got really good DBs. Maybe got all six guys coming back. If I'm going one season, I'm going to go quarterback and take Justin Herbert. Huh? Why would you not take the guy that's a presumed number one pick? If it's for one season. I mean, KJ Costello could be better than him. But. I don't care. The guy's going to be the number one pick. I'm taking him. I would take Cal secondary most likely. Um, You're not, like, switching out maybe, like, a Stanford O-line or something like Stanford that? Stanford O-line is, is, is it's not coming that good. back. It's okay, not great. But I think Utah, uh, may, Utah's probably got 
Is Utah who's got the best O line coming back? That Utah, might be the, Utah that might be the choice. Yeah, it could be. But I I think I'd really like Washington has a really good secondary, but like Cal's like has a ridiculous like everyone's back. Like they're tough. I forgot six Washington guys are lost back. a couple guys. Yeah, Byron Murphy to the draft. So I would probably go with that. Yeah. Good question. I'm taking the quarterback. All anyway, right. that was a great question, Ryan. That was a good introspective one. You got one, Keely? Uh, sure. I got um, one if you don't. I just thought take you'd... one. Yeah, I was not ready. Sorry. <laughs> Rick said, what area of the team do you think is the best and what is the worst after the fall showcase? My take is wide receivers at the top and the offensive line was the worst. I would say wide receivers and probably go secondary was the worst. Maybe uh, you could even say the top is the punter. Yeah. Punting. <laughs> Punting is winning, guys. Yeah. That's not true at all. <laughs> However, the punter could be a weapon this year. True. Mesa wanted to know what are the realistic expectations of the offense compared to last year. Realistic expectations. Realistic. Do you think ten, ten points, points a game uh, better better be like that's the, the offense should have scored ten points better a game last year with the talent the USC had. So they definitely should do it with a better scheme. Yeah, I don't think it's unreasonable to say ten points. No. You know, so I think that's a, a realistic thing. Yeah. Rickard Hammer really wants to know about Pali Pali Naoteote. He wants to know what's up with him and how is his fall camp been so far. He good. <laughs> I mean, he's fine, but I'll be honest, he's not making a ton of plays. You, no. It's not like you're going, oh, my goodness, you see that play? Like, there are times when, even maybe last year at times, you're like, oh, like every day it felt like for a little stretch, you know, he's like, oh, man, did you see him make that play? But it hasn't necessarily been that way. Now, maybe that's partly scheme and, you know, how much is he supposed to do when they're not running the ball a ton in practice and they're not, you he's know. He's in a different spot what, too, right? He's and playing. what he does best is hit people and you're not yeah. doing a ton of hitting. Yeah. Uh, so maybe that has to do with it. I think it's one of those things when, when you go to the game, you're like, oh, yeah, I remember him. He's really good. That's, <laughs> that's what's going to happen. Uh, I forgot who asked this, but someone asked um, – I just lost it. I'm sorry. Um, Keely on top. One Blue Love want to know, did the offense yesterday look like the offense they rolled out against Notre Dame last year? Helton said earlier this year that he wanted to see the offense look more like that offense. And that was the quick passes, the you know moving things quickly, trying to do a little bit of tempo. And yes, that's that's the kind of offense. It was similar, yeah, for. yeah. I would say. I think that's what they're going for. I got it. Someone asked, uh, how are they incorporating the running backs in the the passing game? Uh, Ryan, you little, want to answer that while I pull little up the swing. Test? I mean, little swing passes and stuff like Shotgun said before. Jack Sears, there was one where I think it was uh, Kristen was open and he didn't get him the ball quick enough. And so I think it's one of those things they want to get the ball out quickly, so it's not wait five seconds and then dump it off. It's like, do your reads real quick. Are they open? Otherwise, hey, I'm going to swing it out to Stephen Carr or whatever and, and, and use them. I think they're utilizing them pretty well uh, in the passing game. You want to get those guys open in space because that's where they can make guys miss and you can get some big plays. And they did okay with it yesterday, but I think, you, you know, they got to do a little bit better job. Uh, they had five receptions by running backs yesterday out of 66 passes. I think there was at least one more that was thrown to them that was incomplete. So if you're throwing – Six out of sixty-six passes to them. That's eleven eleven percent there. Um, that's a that's a pretty good chunk, I would that's say, bad, compared yeah. to what you previously had. You know, they're probably going to run some screens and stuff with the running backs. I think they want to get the ball in the hands of Stephen Carr. He didn't have any receptions yesterday, but I think they know what he can do. Yeah. So I think that you're going to see that. And like Ryan said, the the swing passes when they're you know they they've taught them you know look 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 if there's nothing there swing it out and let the running back try to do something. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Daryl wants to know, is the secondary really struggling that much, or is it because the wide receivers are that good? A little bit of a combo. The, there's a pretty big drop-off, similar to the, not as bad as the offensive line, but there's a pretty big drop-off from that first group of seven, eight guys that, to the second group because you just have so many young guys there. Yeah. From McCaula to OT to Jaden uh, Williams. I mean, there's just a number of guys there. Uh, Dorian Hewitt, Britton Allen. You know, there's – Basically, everyone on that second group is just all freshmen. Yeah. And then – Probably like seven or eight DBs in the class, so it's crazy. Yeah, so you got like eight guys there with C.J. Pollard and, you know, the, the multiple cornerbacks that after the, those guys, there's a pretty big drop-off. So I think that's why you're seeing – you know, you see a lot of uh, catches on the secondary. And that, young, that first group is still pretty young too. So, you know, I, I think it's a little bit of a combination, but I think it's just the secondary is really young after there's a drop-off there. Quick one from it's okay, G. Do you guys feel Sears will be the QB two, or it'll be like last year, Fink then Sears? That's interesting. What do you think? That's a hard thing to say. And, yeah. And you know, so I just I, assuming JT Daniels if he wins, right? Yeah. So this was brought up last week during practice, discussing with another reporter, and what you might see is the oars come out, or mm. or uh, or, yeah, one starter and three oars. Yeah. 
Or two oars, technically, with three guys. Right. If I had to choose, I'd probably go with Matt Fink, though. Oh, nice. All right. Is that, is that bad? Is that we had two Glendora calls, so you got to go with Matt Fink. I had to. They would come after yeah. me. We need more San Clemente calls. So that'll work. <laughs> uh, Jasper Smith wants to know who will be returning kicks this year. Stephen Carr, Valus Jones. Pretty much the same guys that you saw last year. Same thing with the punts. You see Tyler Vaughn's back there. The backups, you know, there's a little you, – you see Michael Pittman and Amon Ross St. Brown took some yesterday. But I think you're going to see the same guys. When you have returners at a position, unless you bring in a Dory Jackson as a freshman, right. you're pretty much going to keep the same guys. Yeah. Allen on Facebook says, with Cam Smith gone, who's going to lead the team in tackles? And ITO yeah, I would guess him, mm -hmm. but he's playing the will. He's playing yeah. the will. There's Is still that much difference. Yeah, he's still You're inside. Asking him to tackle people. Yeah. Hopefully, it's not the DBs who led the team in tackling yesterday. Yeah, you don't want like Chase Williams or someone leading the team in tackles, then you're probably in trouble. Well, if your safeties lead the team in tackles, that's not good because that means you've given up a lot of passes and they've had to yeah. make tackles, or you've let the runs get to the yeah. second or if third level. If it's Talanoa then bad. <laughs> Dave Schwartz asks, any thoughts on Swan's take? Do we have a recruiting problem? That was the most ridiculous take ever. I didn't listen to the uh, Dan Patrick interview, but it just saying word. He was just saying words. Like there was no, there was no, nothing behind those words. That's I, have, just, I have it pulled up and have not watched the whole thing yet. But that was just that's laughable. It's not been a recruiting problem. You, They're we, still fourth currently. I think in last yeah. time the twenty four seven did the overall talent on each team. You do a talent chart, so everyone that's left in the class and you you know ranked by the recruiting class. USC was number four in the country last year. They haven't done it, updated it for this year yet. They should it should be coming out pretty soon. But USC is still going to be in the top like seven or eight, the most talented team in the Pac twelve. So yet no, it's not a recruiting problem. That's that's the most ridiculous, uneducated take ever. Jasper Smith, where is Marlon Tui Pelotu regarding his past injuries? He looks great. Yeah. You know, the back seems to be completely healthy. He's making plays. He's going to be a run stopper in the middle of that defense. Uh, I think he's going to have a, a strong year, even if you don't notice him all the time, because defensive tackles don't always get noticed, as Antoine Woods liked to tell me. <laughs> yeah, we don't get noticed. Who Antoine too. Woods is having a monster. You know, he had a monster year last year for Dallas. You know, he's he's doing great for him. So congratulations to him. You yeah. love to see it. Trojan attack. Are we still splitting reps between four quarterbacks? As yes. of right yeah. now, now. Saturday might have been the cutoff, and maybe we see some, you know, one or two guys get dropped out or dropped down. Will we see it, though, Shotgun? Oh, yeah, we don't see. We <laughs> might hear about. <laughs> we don't yes. see crap Fair, anymore. Valid point, Because they're closing practice. Speaking of which, Andrew on YouTube says, what are you guys going to do during your practice ban times? Go to Starbucks and then come back for interviews? Oh, Keely loves Starbucks. Uh, Excuse no, me. I just, we'll, That's not true. <laughs> we'll do more work, I guess. Yeah, you go, on yeah, the, go to the media room, write some st write some stuff, whatever. I'm going to bring a seat and sit outside the door, I guess. I don't know. Something like could that. could do that, yeah. Wow. Where sneaky, they get mad. Sneaky. You could, like, hear, oh. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> JFZ8 keeps asking, I keep hearing that we're a five or six win team. What do you guys think? I think they'll win five or six games, but probably more than that. Like this. <laughs> That's a very Ryan answer. <laughs> yep. Uh, I'm still sitting at 93. I'm not going to change yet. Uh, I might change after the first game when I see how the running game and the offensive line kind of play. But yeah. I'm still at 93 as of now. When I did the whole thing for the Pac-12 podcast, um, I came up with 7-5. and five, But, you know, I think 8-4 and four is probably like the mean, the average. Like that's probably – if things kind of go about average, 8-4 and four would probably be where they'd end up. But you could do a little better than that. You could certainly do worse than that. You know, we'll see. Johnny wants to know, does Clay have a style? That was asked when we were talking about the way they practice and whether or not, like, if he's going to, like, be the enforcer or not. So that's the context for that question. I think that he he is – he's not a scream-at-you-all-the-time type of guy, but he will bring guys into his office, we've heard, and, you know, wear guys out, you know, if they're doing things wrong. So I think he has that – kind of that, that dad personality uh, where – you know, he wants to be proud of you in public, but he'll wear you out in private if he needs to type of thing. You know, just go off on you, whatever it is. Um, but, you know, I would say his style is some some kind, some flannels, I would guess, would be in there. That would be, I guess, on his style. He's not <laughs> he's not very much like a Lin Swan, you know, super tight jean style. No, a little khaki sometimes, yeah. maybe. Uh, no, I mean, he's, <laughs> he's like, you know, he's a, a nice guy. He's like your uncle. He's out there. And, I, you know, I think he feels like he'll – come up with a plan uh his dad is a big influence on on him and the way he used to coach and i think he just tries to stick with the plan it's not it's not really going to be out there and be you know crazy and doing different things all the time it's like here's what the plan is and we're going to stick you know go along with that it's it's kind of a little bit more conservative sort of thing and uh, i i guess that's that would be his style 
Hard to describe, I guess, but. Trek wants to know, is the stadium going to be louder with the new construction? Like, will the noise bounce off the glass? I don't think we really get to find out that no. yesterday. Everyone's no. asking that. Um, it's hard to. It's hard to say. Like, no one's ever really done anything like this before. Put a building in the I would the guess stadium. not. Just looking at the geometry of it, I don't think that it creates a reverberation. I could yeah. be wrong. I'm not an architect. And I don't know. I'm not a sound doctor or anything. But Sound doctor. Yeah, know. it's just this wide open bowl will, with like a, like a, you know, a stump. I, I, I don't think it's going to help. But some people have asked that. I, I just, I don't know if we'll know until like a big game where they have a lot of people there. Cam wants to know, I hear Drake London and Maneer McLean and Devo, Devin Williams, are all beasting. Does either one demand more time challenging the vets? Hmm. Devin Williams, I mean, he's... Devin Williams has to concentrate and catch the ball every time. Once he does that, then he moves himself into that conversation. But until then, I, but the thing is, I, I don't think it's going to matter. I don't think it's, hey, one guy's going to replace somebody because you're going to rotate a bunch of guys. Yeah, yeah. they're all going to play. I yeah. think those three are going to be with the other, what, four, five, five guys, four guys. Uh, <laughs> and you add one more guy in there, you're going to have eight guys basically going all the time. And that's what Clay has said. You know, I think Graham Harrell said 10, Keely, is that right? He wants yeah, 10 he guys? said he did 10. So, you know, they're going to, they want to rotate guys. They got a buddy system that, you know, that, you know, when one guy gets tired, another guy's coming in. So they're going to rotate a bunch, I think. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Matthew James on Facebook says, what is the biggest strength and weakness of this team? I think we answered that with the position yeah. groups to an extent. Yeah, I think the wide receivers are obviously really, really good. I mean, the, you can still have a question mark about the coaching staff and, you know, does it gel? Does it work together with the fact that you have an O-line coach that hasn't taught the spread offense and a spread offensive coordinator and – you know, he doesn't really have any position coaches besides Mike Jinks. He has one position coach out of four. Uh, th I think that's a question mark. That could be a weakness. Uh, but those are things we don't really know until we, we see him on the field. The secondary is still a question mark. The offensive line, you know, there's question marks. We don't know that it's necessarily going to be a weakness. Could yeah. be, could be different. Speaking right. of which, sorry, Andrew on Facebook says, do you three believe more in Drevno to coach up the offensive line or the defensive backs coach to help our young secondary? Oh. That's good a good question. question, and I want to say that I've been really impressed by what Greg Burns does. Yeah. And I will say that with a caveat versus Tim Drevno that we don't get to see what he does. Right. It's hard to see him. The defensive they're, backs. They're in the corner. Yeah. With, you know, while we were able to watch practice. <laughs> Which we can't anymore. Uh, we, you know, the DBs were much closer to us. We got to see how he was teaching them up. And I think both of those position groups, a really interesting thing is happening because of Vianne Talamavayo and because of Chris Hawkins. Both those groups, offensive line and secondary, get to split up. So V gets to take half the group of linemen, and Drevno gets to take half the group of linemen. And they can focus and do more individual stuff. And the same thing with the DBs, that uh, Chris Hawkins can take the safeties, and Greg Burns can take the cornerbacks and really focus on individual technique and different things. And I think it's helped both groups. And obviously those are two big question marks, but I think that, that those are extra resources there with GAs that are, that are helping out there. Yeah. We got one on uh, Periscope. 93065 Trojan. I'm guessing uh, there was no sighting of Urban Meyer or Reggie Bush at the scrimmage. A little sarcasm. No. Neither one of those guys. It's funny. In the press box, they have a bunch of football players that were former football players that are in the media. And they had guys like Lynn Swan and Pat Hayden, Matt Leinart, uh, Curtis Conway, um, Willie McGinnis and stuff. So I put the video of that up on Twitter. And then all these people were pointing out people that are in the – former football players that are in the media like Petros Papadakis or John Jackson or O.J. Simpson or uh, Reggie Bush, and those guys were not uh, pictured there. So I don't know what it was, but it, it kind of got crazy on Twitter. People were talking about that. But, uh, sorry. No, oh, yeah. Uh, we have a question from John on Facebook. He says, is this team more disciplined than last year based on yesterday's scrimmage? There were still some flags yesterday, mm -hmm. but I, I think that you're – They've eliminated to an extent the the easy stuff, the mental stuff, the yeah. false starts, the jumping off sides, those type of things that shouldn't be happening. That are they're more mental than physical necessarily. And you're still going to have some pass interferences and you know holding calls and stuff like that. But I think they're correcting the ones that are more mental, and the other ones are going to be just physical things. You're going to have some physical mistakes during a game. You know the physical beats. Uh, but and those can lead to penalties. 
But I, I think the mental mistakes, that having the refs there, the players are learning what they can get away with and can't get away with, and I think that they're you know, the harping on it. I think it's re- done a really good job. I think that was something they attacked this offseason. I think it, it's, it's shown so far. Now, we'll see once you get into the game and there's you know 90,000 people around you versus 10,000 yesterday. If it changes, that might be different. But uh, so far, so good on that, that uh, aspect. Yeah, I'm really curious to see how uh, adding refs to spring and fall camp really changes the, the discipline issue. Yeah. We should probably wrap it up, huh? Someone commented, Shh, if you don't tell them, they won't know you that they're going towards two hours. <laughs> way, way too long. <laughs> True. I can still talk for days. Including New Zoo Guru wants to know, why does Helton need to look at the tape? What's wrong with his eyes? Well, I don't know if you noticed, but there's 11 guys on the field on offense, 11 on defense. Yeah. It's kind of hard to watch 22 people at once. Yeah, there's a lot going on. You want to be able to see individual matchups, especially on the line. So I think a lot of that, when you talk about the offensive line, look at the tape, completely makes sense. People are asking me, I'm like, I'd really have to go back and, and watch it and see, you know, you can't watch every guy and who's getting beat and what's going on. You, every play is different. They were mixing up different, you know, guys and, uh, you know, you, which group was better on the offensive line. I think you really have to go back and look at the tape to kind of know that stuff. So. Yeah. When I rewatch the games and when, like, Keely comes over to, to watch the games with me, I, wa- I watch them five to eight times usually a play. And you learn so much. Because you can focus on one player on this and you rewind it. Well, let me see. Well, if he, he did a really good job, but there was a guy who came through there. What happened? And you look and see what else happened. And, you know, you can kind of start – you basically are kind of detective detectiving – you know, <laughs> what is going on on the play? Uh, you know, if, if there's a good play, you say, okay, how did that happen? If there's a bad play, how did that happen? Yeah. You just kind of kind of figure it out. Where by did it start things. to go wrong? It was like, oh, one guy missed an assignment. Or, oh, everybody did something wrong. Like, it just depends, you know? And Chuck and I are on the field for each game, and sometimes your ground-level impression is completely different once you break it down on your, the aerial tape. It can change what you think. This person did this wrong. This person did it right. It can change. So I think that's... It, and given that he's coaching these players, he doesn't want to say something wrong um, and have that have a, a consequence with his relationship with yeah. players. So I You're think like, Austin oh, Jackson sucked. And you go back and like, oh, no, he was actually really good. Like, and you, you just wanna... said that to the media yeah, and yeah. it's not good. <laughs> yeah. right. Oh, are we wrapping it up? I was just going to end it on that one. Oh, OK. So good. many more questions, guys. Thank you guys so much for the questions. We'll be back. When? I don't... <laughs> uh, we might have to do one Thursday. I don't know. We'll see. I will, I will not be available Thursday. We got high school football going on, guys. The high school football season's already started. That's crazy. Okay. We'll we'll see. But the thing is, we will be doing our normal schedule that we did last season. Thursdays, we're going to be doing at night now, and also seven p.m. on Sundays to break yeah. down the game. Um, but yeah, thank you guys so much. A lot of questions today. Uh, just that time of year. We'll make sure to answer more of them next time. Uh, but guys, any final thoughts before we wrap it up? Again, yeah, thanks for, I mean, all the calls, all the questions. Like, we haven't done a show for a couple of weeks, and to have, like, hundreds of people on all the different platforms, uh, it was great. It's great to see uh, USC fans are fired up. But the football season is less than two weeks away. Crazy. Week zero is next week. You get to watch Arizona, you, one of USC's opponents playing, playing next Hawaii, weekend. Yeah. Playing at Hawaii, Miami, right? Florida? Yeah, pretty neat. So, college football's back. We are ready. Ooh. And we appreciate you all uh, tuning in and everything. And make yeah. sure you check out uscfootball.com. Like tons of stuff there. Mm-hmm. And if you're wa- whatever platform you're watching it on, like it, subscribe, do all those good stuff. Yeah. That helps us out as well. Share it with your friends. Yeah, all that good stuff. But thanks so much for watching. Like we said, we'll be back. Make sure to follow us on Twitter and whatnot. We'll be tweeting out our schedule and when we're coming back on. But that's Shotgun. That's Ryan. I'm Keely. We'll see you all next time.